Well, morning, everyone. Yeah, thanks for that. It's great to see you all. We uh, sometimes we find out how delicate our bodies are, don't we? When we do stretches and that sort of thing, and uh, when you hear a, a loud bang, I looked down at my hands and I sort of thought, "What did I drop?" And you know, typical thick male, I had nothing in my hands to drop. But anyway, I, I sort of took me a while, you know, a few split seconds to figure out that I've torn something. But anyway. The camera person is very happy, so I won't be able to wander around very much this morning, and uh, so <laughs> we can keep some people happy. Anyway, um, it's uh, good to be here with you this morning, and I'd um, like to, my sermon's entitled uh, Fine Tuning, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the fine tuning of our universe, and uh, I'll speak about that a little bit more later. Um, but for now, I'd just like to just take you to this place here. And uh, this is, was a ski hut in, uh, in Bolivia. 15,000 feet up in the air it was there. And uh, it was to take the, the skiers there on, uh, on the glacier. But uh, unfortunately, the glacier is all gone and, and so has the ski field. And... Uh, but what I find remarkable about these things is how they park a hut on the edge of a cliff like this. And uh, there's a few of these here that I'd like to just share with you this morning. And uh, right there on this mountain, it's a little bit hard to see because it's quite camouflaged. This one's in Switzerland. And, uh, but a hut sort of parked right on the top there. And again, what, what a remarkable piece of engineering let alone walking up there, you know. And uh, this one here is also around about 14,000 feet up in the air. So th these things aren't on top of, you know, little hills like Kosciuszko. And um, this one's a favourite here. This one's in Italy. And so uh, some will be happy to see this one in Italy. This one's actually quite a remarkable piece. Didn't, didn't keep some of the um, people very happy. They didn't like the design of it, but I thought it was actually pretty good, actually. But... And you can see what a remarkable view that is. And this one's from Bulgaria. Well, this one's a little bit rough, isn't it? Rough and ready. But I guess if you've been climbing all day and you're desperate, you would be desperate, wouldn't you? You would need to be. I've stayed in a bivouac like this, and I tell you, you're very grateful for it when you need it. But this one, I love this one. This one's on the top of the Matterhorn. Now, in order to get to this one, you actually got to climb the Matterhorn. You've got to climb it and then climb down to this one. Isn't that remarkable? How do they get... I mean, these things are so high, barely choppers are barely able to get there. Now, this is what I love, oh, h and S. <laughs> <laughs> You would not want to be a rush to get out of there, <laughs> would you? That is a long way down, isn't it? Just amazing, isn't it? You would think that they would put a railing there, wouldn't you? You would think that, but I guess not. Well, I guess if you climb down there, you would know how to keep yourself there. This one here is also parked on a, on a ledge as well, and, and uh, the warning came with, if nature calls, be careful. Do not rush out. And, uh, yeah, for, for, for a very good reason. So, but they're, they're more prestigious ones around. These are ones that tourists can go to. And uh, a bit of an odd-shaped one, uh, also in Switzerland. Switzerland really has some beautiful, beautiful huts. Um, this one is a favourite one of mine. And I think you'd love to just sit there and think, wouldn't you? Now, this is one that we can all go to. Here. This one's in the far north of Norway, about 120 kilometres north of the Arctic Circle. And uh, you can go there, you can stay there for a month, and it'll cost you about 100,000 krona to stay there. Um, they have multiple stays there, but that's the kind of view that you have. The weather is wild all year round, 
And so if you're a writer, and I'm not a writer, or if you're a musician, I'm not a musician, or if you just want to stay there and just enjoy wild weather, that part I would love. And uh, wouldn't that be terrific? I think that would be lovely. Now I want you to imagine. Go somewhere like that. You run up the stairs and you get there and you've got a coat just made for you. On the table, your favourite chocolates. In the fridge, your favourite foods. And there your bed is ready there made for you. Your temperature is just right. And you would be thinking, they were expecting me. Wouldn't you? But not just anyone, but me. Because they had my favourite soup, my favourite gluten steak, done medium rare, my chai latte, my soy decaf skinny latte, and all the things that you've ever dreamed about waiting there for you. And wouldn't you think that's terrific? Absolutely. Someone was expecting you. And this is what it's like with our universe. We talk about creation. Our universe was made for us. We talk about the, the, the planet and in terms of the, the earth, you know, just being just the right size, our environment, our, the, the fruit and the vegetables and the things that we that we eat and um, that they're all made for us. But we don't often think about the universe being made for us. And I don't want us to be, oh, well, the whole universe, you know, like old Copernicus who, who broke the, the, um, the long-standing tradition that the universe revolved around us. I don't want to be like that. But in actual fact, the universe was and is actually made for life and life on this planet. And some of the things here, and I'll just give you a wee bit of a taste of it this morning, and so we'll rediscover a, a little bit of maths, and along with a, a few illustrations to help us to understand that this universe is created. Now, as you're aware, we are doing a, a series on uh, walking along the narrow path. And, you know, God says to us, we walk through the gate along the narrow path on our way to heaven. How does this fit in? We need to know as we walk along this narrow path, God has our back. He is there. Because there are some times we think, where is God? Is he there? And I want to give you indisputable evidence that God is there. And he has got our back. He has our back. Now, I want you to come to 1 Peter chapter. First Peter First, first Peter chapter 3, and we'll have a look at verse 15. But in your hearts, what does he say here? But in your hearts, what? Honour Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. I'll ask you here today, can you give a defence for what you believe? Can you give good reasons for what you believe? 
Only you can answer that one. Why do we believe that God created us? How, what evidence do we have? God doesn't leave us with blind faith. And if we come over to Hebrews chapter 11, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the convictions of, of verse one, sorry. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Now, it says here that God made the universe, and when people look back at the Bible, people in this day and age of reason and scientific analysis will go, you've got rocks in your head. You believe in fairy tales. In the beginning, God created. It's like saying, once upon a time, how do we know that God created the universe? Just come with me now just uh, to Psalms chapter 19. You know, faith is not something that is just a blind faith. Faith is something that we can work through with reason and with substance that we can think through, that we can process. And I want us to be able to do that this morning. And David writes a psalm here in, in Psalm 19. Psalm 19. And we'll just read the first three verses. All right. And I want you to picture what David was doing that day. What was David's occupation? Shepherd. Shepherd. So where would he be? In the hills. Now all the pollution coming over from Jerusalem, he may not have been able to see the sky. Would that be right? Whoops. Not quite. No pollution. Be laying back there, nice balmy evening. He's looking at the sky, he's looking up, he's thinking, he's reflecting. And this is what he says. And as he ponders the sky, to the choir, um, to the choir master, Psalm of David, the heavens, what? Declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals what? Knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. But the voice is heard through the glory of the heavens. And, you know, as he looks up, the heavens speak to David. Speak loudly. And declare the glory, but to a person living in the 21st century would roll their eyes and go, he's just a, what? A shepherd boy. He's just a shepherd. What would he know? Well, fine tuning of the universe reveals the glory of God through science. And many scientists today have become believers in the fine-tuning of the universe because of the remarkable evidence that fine-tuning brings. So what is fine-tuning? It's the observation of complex life of any kind that would be impossible anywhere if the physical 
nature be constraints, varied by small amounts, and if the universe is finely tuned, therefore there must be a fine tuner. So what it's saying is that there is certain physical constraints that for the universe to exist, they must be very finely tuned. And if they vary to, uh, on either side by a very small amount, life would not exist. All right? So, Hugh Ross states this, that the entire physical universe is humanity's house. It must be precisely as massive and spatially extensive. So in other words, the universe is huge. It's got to be that big and as old it is to allow our existence. All the home's exterior features require precise construction for physical life, be possible anywhere within it, for life to be possible anywhere within it. Unless exterior features are designed just as they are, the cosmic interior features required for complex, enduring, and advanced physical life can neither be established or maintained. Hugh Ross is a astrophysicist he is part of Reasons to Believe, and he is um, very much a devout Christian. Now, the next person is Paul Davies. Paul Davies is an agnostic. He is not a believer, but he does state this, that the cliche that life is balanced on a knife edge is a staggering understatement. And in this case, no knife in the universe could have an, e an edge that fine. So that was um, Paul Davies, his analysis on, on that. So now, let, let's just have a look at, at a few things. So our planet, for life to exist on our planet, we have to be the right size. If it's a little bit too bigger, we wouldn't be able to walk around on it the way that we do. Because Gravity would be too heavy or too large. Would be. So our planet has to be the right size. Also, the right distance from the sun, etc. The moon, well, we have to have the right size moon. Now, this moon here that we have is by far the largest in our solar system. And it's 2,159 miles across. And I'm going to throw a few figures at you this morning. But he, here's something that is odd, but it's interesting. Does anyone know the distance between the moon and Earth? It's around about 240,000 miles which is a wee way, which is about the distance of one four hundredth to the sun. So the distance of the moon to the earth is one four hundredth of what the earth is to the sun. And here's something interesting. The diameter of the moon is about one four hundredth of that of the size of the sun. Which makes an interesting coincidence. So the diameter of the moon is one four hundredth that of the size of the sun. And so that's why we have perfect eclipses. Which is interesting. Why would you do that? Because the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And through us looking at the heavens, we can gain knowledge. And interestingly enough, through eclipses, they have made some staggering discoveries. It was through eclipses that they discovered helium. And the theory of relativity was confirmed that light bends and that was only proved because of an eclipse by Eddington. And so one four hundredth, interesting coincidence there. But here's something else that I didn't know that I also find interesting. How many planets do we have? Oh yeah, about nine. Yeah, well I guess that's contested now, isn't it? But when I was at school it was nine. So we'll leave it at nine, shall we? <laughs> But, because we've got the big planets, we've got Jupiter. What's after Jupiter? 
Saturn, what's the other two? Uranus and Neptune. Of course, why do they need to exist in part of our universe? These planets here serve a very important function for life on Earth. Without those big planets, and we know that Jupiter with its huge storm, you know that great big red dot that's in the middle? Do you know how, how windy it is there? Around about 600 odd kilometres an hour. Now that will blow your toupee off, wouldn't it? Sure would. So anyway, that's, that's Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and uh, Uranus and Neptune. So these four planets, if you like, in an American football terms, runs quarterback for the Earth. What that means is that there's a whole lot of asteroids that are running around, and you know those global killer asteroids that are supposed to um, pummel Earth? Well, there was one that did hit Earth in 1908 in, in Russia, and, uh, they, and uh, it was only three metres, um, three metres, which is not a big, you wouldn't think that's big, but it did um, flatten eight million trees. So, these four planets here are essential for life on this planet because, what did I say their function was that they run? Quarterback. They protect because of their gravity, because of the size of their planets, they act like vacuum cleaners that suck up all the asteroids and they take the punch. All right, they take one for the team. In fact, they take a lot for the team. And so without them, we would not be able to exist. And so now as we go out of, the, with, um, out of our solar system, we come to, this is what the artist's impression of the, uh, within that, but it's the Milky Way. They think this is what the Milky Way would look like. Obviously we can't quite get a bird's eye view of it, so to speak, but that's what they think. So we live in what is called an elliptical galaxy. There's something like, I don't know, a couple of hundred billion stars in it. Do you know how many galaxies there are? Some said it's 100 billion. Some says it's a lot more with 100 billion stars. In it. You know, they, they, these figures are staggering, isn't it? That alone should be a mind-boggling. But do you know that our, it's important for our solar system to be where it is within the Milky Way? And we are parked here in the Orion arm of the Milky Way. Well, what would it matter in space? Who cares where you park your solar system? Well, it is important. Because if you're too close, there's that bright constellation of stars of, that would cause too much radiation and gamma rays for life to exist on Earth. So we have to be further out. If we're too far out, the planets will be too small. So we need just the right kind of galaxy for life to exist on Earth. Do you find that amazing? I, th I think that's incredible. Because if we were, and there's another kind of galaxy that's an elliptical kind of, um, oh, this is a spiral galaxy, the elliptical kind of galaxy, the orbits are too unstable for Earth to have in that kind of galaxy. So we're being in a spiral galaxy, need to be in the right kind of galaxy, as well as being in the right position. Now, this is where things get even more interesting. Um, <clears throat> in the universe, there are essentially a number of parameters that need to be finely tuned in order for life to exist. There's something like around about 25, depending on who you talk to. These 25 parameters must be exactly right 
And all of them have got to be right. And so Paul Davies, he's the agnostic astrophysicist. It's like twiddling your knobs when making things. But you've got to twiddle the knobs and get them exactly right. He was the one who said about the knife edge. You couldn't get a fine enough knife. Now, there are four essential forces in the universe. Electromagnetism, gravity, strong nuclear force and weak nuclear force. Don't worry about too much about all of that. We'll just look at gravity. That one's a lot easier to look at. Now, scientists are slowly waking up to an inconvenient truth. You remember that phrase, the inconvenient truth? All right, the universe looks suspiciously like a, a fix. The issue concerns the, the, the variety of laws of the nature of themselves. For 40 physicists and cosmologists have quietly been collecting examples of all too convenient coincidences and special features in the underlying laws of the universe that seem to be necessary in order for life and hence conscious beings to exist. Change any one of them and the consequences would be what? Now Paul Davies is not a Christian. He's an agnostic at best. Change any one of them and life would be lethal. However, the mass of the universe is fine-tuned to provide two essential features simultaneously. Just right amounts of the diversity of elements the just right expansion rates throughout the cosmic history so that certain types of stars and planets form just at the right times and the right locations. Fine tuning provides two essential characteristics louder than a whisper at a principal design and so does a high degree of fine tuning. Now, you, you get the idea, don't you? When it comes to gravity, when they're talking about the expansion of the universe, galaxies and planets are all expanding, but they're all expanding at a constantly the same rate. And the gravity has to be absolutely precise. If the gravity is too weak, Certain elements, certain elements could not be formed that are essential for life. If it goes to, if the gravity is too strong, the universe won't expand and the heavier elements will not form. If it's too weak, it'll expand too quickly and there'll be no essential elements. So your Anyone do chemistry in upper high school? I didn't. For a very good reason. Everyone said it was far too hard. But when you looked at the periodic table, there were, what, how many elements were there on it? Sorry? Does anyone know? Hmm? Lots. <laughs> That'll do. Now, if the gravity was too weak, the periodic table would be completely empty. The periodic table would be blank. If the gravity was to expand, um, if the gravity was too strong, there would only be the heavier elements and not the, the lighter elements. We need all of these elements in our universe for life. The precision, now this is where it gets fun. The precision by which gravity is tuned is 10 to the power of 60. That is one with 60 zeros on it. There are 25 parameters that need are required for a finely tuned universe. Gravity is one. And you need gravity that is finely tuned 10 to the power of 60. The number of cells in your body is 10 to the power of 14. And so we've got another 46 zeros to go on top of this. 
This is numbers that are, this is a number that is incomprehensible to everyone. 10 to the power of 60. This is accepted by astrophysicists, believers and non-believers. 10 to the power of 60. What does that look like? Paul Davis, sorry not Paul Davis, Hugh Ross comes up with an illustration of the aircraft carrier. Now, this is the Nimitz class aircraft carrier. 1,100 feet long, displaces 100,000 tons. 5,000 people on it, this is a big ship. The, this is the best way for a nation to project power uh, ar around the world. And <clears throat> if you were to sink one of these, it would require a lot of firepower. The Yanks decided, let's try, shall we? So <laughs> they conducted creatively called sink exercise. The Yanks are very creative in 2005. And so what they did was they got, they decommissioned one of these things. These are $13 billion, the latest one, the Gerald Ford, 13 and a half billion. You wouldn't want to lose that, would you? So in the sink exercise, they thought, well, okay, well, let's see what it takes to sink one of these mummers and one of these ships. Anyway, do you know what it took? Four weeks of pummeling it with a variety of weapons from the Air Force to the Navy and to submarines. And eventually, after four weeks of pummeling one of these things, it eventually sank. These things sit in the, uh, in the sea. They are not that easy to track by other nations. They are protected by destroyers, cruisers, submarines, satellites, and everything around them. So these things are well protected. Now, what does it take to paint one of these things? An awful lot of paint. About 10 million litres of paint. So that is a lot from Bunnings. <laughs> now, in that paint, Hugh Ross says this. That 10 to the power of 60 is like painting the entire aircraft carrier and having the difference of one fleck of paint would be the difference between sinking the aircraft carrier or it floating. One fleck. So it'll only take one fleck of getting gravity wrong for life not to exist here on Earth if gravity was wrong in, in our universe. And that's a, a staggering amount. The degree of fine tuning is so great that right after the universe beginning, it could have destroyed the possibility of life with, by subtracting a single dime's mass from the whole world observable universe or by adding a single dime. He also, Hugh Ross also gives another illustration of covering the entire North America with dimes or five cent pieces. And then if you were, as including um, Mexico and Central America, and then if you were to stack those dimes up 20,000 feet high, that would cover Mount McKinley. And then if you two times that by 12, that would be 240,000 feet high. And then if you were to stack them even further, that they were 240,000 miles high, you'll be bumping against the moon. And then times that by one billion continents. And then you've got to find a red dime. This is the difference between life and no life. And if there's a red dime and you've got to go and find that, adding or subtracting that red dime 
would indeed be the difference between life and death. Sir Fred Hoyle likens the creation dilemma to a junkyard, and he was talking also, in, uh, he was talking in terms of, of evolution, and uh, he says a junkyard contains all the bits and pieces of a Boeing 747 and dismembered and disarrayed. And a whirlwind happens to blow through the yard, and what is the chance that after its passage, a fully assembled 747 is ready to fly, will be found standing there? So small as to be negligible, even if a tornado were to blow through enough junkyards to fill the whole universe. So what are the chances of that happening? Stephen Hawking um, has, has this to say and the quote is gone. Well, that's odd. He had a number of zeros, point zero 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 one, in his book, A Brief History of Time, of the chances of all this happening. So when it comes to the chances of the universe coming into existence, astrophysicists and cosmologists who are unbelievers are trying to come up with a whole lot of other explanations as to how the universe came about, such as the multiverse, which means that there are a whole lot of other universes. Oh, what evidence would you have for that? Absolutely none. What that means is that you have a whole lot of other universes that will increase the chances of the universe coming in by chance. Now, we've just seen with gravity 10 to the power of 60 as to what their chances of that are. Let me just, on a lighter moment, just share with you a video clip. This is, goes back to my generation of a film, Dumber and Dumber. <laughs> Aptly named, I might, I might point out. And <clears throat> this is Jim Carrey wanting to um, propose to his girlfriend. Do you press play or do I press play? Please don't hit me with it. Just give it to me straight. I came a long way just to see you, Mary. Just least you can do is level with me. What are my chances? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> yeah! I read you. Please don't. <laughs> don't. Don't you love that? <laughs> we got a chance, you know? 10 to the power of 60. All right, so, um, and this is the problem that faces the fine tuners. And if you think that you've got a chance with a one in a million, how do you think it's going to go with 10 to the power of 60? And when all these probabilities are added up, if we combined all the laws that must be fine-tuned, we couldn't even write down that number in full, since it would require more zeros than the number of elementary particles in the universe. Let me explain that. Weinberg, who's one of the most, they call the four horsemen of the uh, atheists. And uh, he's one of the four horsemen, and they are the atheists, the evangelists of the atheists. And Weinberg said that if you combine the chances and the probabilities of all these, say, 25 um, physical constraints, uh, attributes that are required to make the universe, 
at the probabilities, if you were to combine them, it would be 10 to the power of 120. The number of protons and atoms in the entire universe is 10 to the power of 80. So if you were to write a zero on every atom in the universe, you'd run out of atoms. That is the probability of the universe coming about by chance. Is there a probability in that? Absolutely not. Gravity. Gravity. 10 to the power of 60. Is a, an incredible number that we can't comprehend. There was a man, an astronomer by the name of Alan Sandage, who was one of the greatest astronomers. He was Edwin Hubble's protege. He won numerous awards as an astronomer, prestigious awards, top of his game. When he looked at all of this, back in the 1970s, he would have been raised in an age where the physical laws were thought to be random, and then the pendulum shift to say, well, no, the law, physical laws or the laws of physics aren't random, they're actually are finely tuned. And as they began to see all the different uh, finely tuned laws of physics in the universe, he started to question in, 19, in the 70s that there must be a fine tuner. And it was in 1985 that he was at a physicist conference and where all the eminent scientists were there. And he had the poise um, to come out of the closet and say that I am a Bible-believing Christian because of fine-tuning. Because of the laws of the universe are so finely tuned that the probabilities of them coming about by accident are so remote as to be ridiculous. And Herschel, who was also one of another of these four horsemen of the apocalypse, of the atheists, who was caught in a weak moment when a microphone was shoved into his face in the car. And he said, well, if you were looking at from the other side, what do you think is their best argument? And he was promoting atheism. And he said, well, fine-tuning would be the best argument. Fine-tuning. What does this say to me? I, when, when I first became an Adventist, I, I wrestled with this for a long time. The evolution. I, I, I knew that the church believed in creation. I looked at Genesis and I thought, once upon a time, I struggled for a number of years with the idea of, because I, I, I was brought up with, as, as an evolutionist. I, I loved the theory of evolution and I, I loved it in science and in high school, it was the only one that I studied. And so I had to park that one, you know, creation, evolution for a number of years when I became an Adventist because. I simply couldn't find any really good answers. You know, people say, oh, you've just got to have faith. Well, I want to say to you, faith is just more than just a mere assent, a mere belief. We can have good, very good reasons to believe what we believe. And this tells me that this gives, God wants to reveal knowledge through the heavens. And through natural revelation, he reveals to us that he exists. I've only given you a, a, a little snippet. Eric um, Metaxas, uh, he, he um, wrote a book called The Death of Atheism. And that book was a, a, a play on Time magazine's The Death of Christianity back in the 1960s. And so... He wrote this book, and, and, and if you were to read that, 
his book is the most accessible when it comes to this kind of information. So when it comes to, you know, there was David laying down there. He didn't have access to all this information. King David could sort of see as a shepherd, as a simple person, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. In our scientific and rational world that we live in, we now have incontrovertible proof that this world is created and there is a fine tuner. But as we sit here, that's nice known 10 to the power of 60, that the number of atoms in this world is 10 to the power of 80, and that the probabilities of the cosmological constant being at 10 to the 120, these numbers are totally meaningless. What does it mean for you sitting here? There is a God who not only created the right universe just for us, but it's not just about us, but he loved us so much that he came to this world. You know, we... Neil Armstrong... When he was on Apollo 11, when he was coming back to earth, he put up his thumb against the earth and the earth disappeared. The earth looked small and it was. We feel small before the universe but so we should, so as that we don't get too big for our boots. Man has been very creative in the different creation theories down through the centuries and millennia. Egypt worshipped cats and dung beetles. Now you can roll your eyes, as well as the sun. Dung beetles? Fair dinkum. And then down through the millennia, they worship the sun, all in different names in different places and in different times. But they worship the sun. That was probably the most popular one. And as well as the different cults. Why? Because we could confine God to who we want, how we want, and confine him in a box so that I can do what I want, when I like, how I like, and they did. We're no different today. Our world has tried to extricate God out of the equation to say that in rational thought there is no God. So we can do what we like, when we like, how we like. And so we need to see where we fit in the universe. But what is man that God is mindful of him? He made us a little lower than the angels. But what is man and woman that God is mindful of them? Yes, God and Paul Davies term sat there in creation and twiddled those knobs, finally tuned this universe created this planet, made a beautiful home for Adam and Eve. And then Adam and Eve decided to reject. Sin came into this world along with death. God did not leave earth by itself. He came to this planet. The, one, the very one who created this planet with such precision was interested to this woman who had a bleeding disease for all her life or most of her life. Spent her entire fortune where she thought all I could do if I could just touch his garment I would be healed. Jesus was interested in her. Jesus was interested in the man with the withered hand. 
And when it came to the thief on the cross, there was Jesus in incredible pain, suffering, nailed to the cross, came to this earth to pay the penalty that we might live eternally with him. On the cross, there was the other thief who had rejected him, who didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. But the other thief says, please remember me when you come again. And what was Jesus' reply? Today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. Isn't that great news? That's terrific news. And God has created the planet that is just right, came and suffered uh, and died that we might live. And he is worthy of worship, is he not? And we can worship God not only as our creator, but we worship him also because he is our redeemer. He's interested in our lives and he's also interested in transforming our lives. Let him be number one in our lives. Let us not make ourselves the center of the universe. God died that we might live eternally with him. And he's got a great world made for us, for us to look forward to. Good news, isn't it?